afternoon. Um, so we are going to start now with our first panel on unpacking women's uh, empowerment chaired by Vrinda Narain, the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Law here at McGill University. So I'll put, put it over to her. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very excited to, to chair today's uh, uh, first opening panel. Um, I'm going to keep my comments very, very short. I would like to introduce our three speakers today. Um, each, each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes, and that gives us 15 minutes for a Q&A uh, afterwards. So uh, our first speaker will be um, Eleanor. She's associate professor at National University of San Martin and a researcher at the Institute for Economic and Social Development in Argentina. Uh, our next speaker will be Lisa, Lisa Baldes, uh, professor of government and Latin American, Latino and Caribbean studies uh, at, at the Dartmouth Center for the Advancement of Learning at Dartmouth College. Um, and I'll uh, last speaker will be Bipasha Barua. She's a Canada Research Chair in Global Women's Issues and a tenured full professor in the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research at the University of Western Ontario. So welcome, uh, welcome to all of you. And we'll start off with um, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here, so I thank this invitation that honored me coming from the South. Uh, the concept of empowerment was coined by the feminist movement in the 80s, along with the language about gender equality. According to Cornwall and Rivas, their efforts can be declared a resounding success. The international development industry has fully embraced these terms. As we know, women's movement was able to link these concepts to the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995. This allowed for the inclusion a few years later in the MDGs and recently in the SDGs. How successful was the feminist project? How much of its original power was lost or runs the risk of being diluted due to this resounding success? Clearly, important advancements were made in relation to women's rights. However, such advancements were not equally distributed among women in the world. In this presentation, I will share my reflections on some tensions left open by the notion of empowerment and its current uses, referring especially to Latin American context. I will refer to two main issues. One, the first one is economic empowerment, the second one is political empowerment. The first tension relates to economic empowerment, more specifically to how economic empowerment is promoted through measures that target the micro level, while on the macro level, inequalities only continue to increase. As the concept of empowerment became part of the global agenda, Latin America in the 90s was going through a profound recessionary process. While ECLAC had baptized the 1980s the lost decade, during the 1990s neoliberal recipes were implemented to the letter, reducing state benefits and making labor markets more flexible. This resulted in growing polarization and an increase in social inequalities. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer. Male unemployment was accompanied by a significant loss of purchasing power for, of their income. This, along with transformation sorry, in the family with more female heads of households, contributed to the increase in women's participation in the labor market. The paradox was that this process, which gave women's, women greater economic power, took place in a very unfa unfavorable context, leading to a significant feminization of poverty. By that time, I used to work in UNICEF in Colombia, and microcredit were presented as the panacea of women's empowerment. The experience of the Grameen Bank in India seemed to be a model that could be replicated globally with infallible results. But economic empowerment cannot be subsumed under access to meager resources while leaving out the discussion on labor rights, redistribution of unpaid work, and access to property. 
During the last decade in Latin America, socioeconomic situation has improved. Within this context, massive conditional cash transfer programs were implemented with women receiving a stipend for the benefit of their families and children. Such programs were based on a maternalistic perspective, enhancing women's care responsibilities within their households. However, it is not it is not possible to significantly increase women's access to economic resources without transforming the sexual division of labor and the political, economic, and institutional structures that sustain it. Regarding employment, when a woman finds a job, we know it is more likely that her job does not come with the benefits and security imposed by local regulations, at least in our countries. In spite of this, the relations between women's low income and their high level of dedication to domestic and care work was left out of the perspective of many Latin American governments, with the few exception of Uruguay and more recently Chile. Against this backdrop, in a world in which transnational capitalism grows stronger by the minute, economic inequality only continues to increase. According to Oxfam, eight white men, in fact, hold the same amount of resources as 3.8 billion people, most of them women. In addition, the gap between women from the lower classes and women from the wealthy classes with higher levels of education, access to better jobs, and who tends to commodify care work is also widening in the third world. Can we assume that women are homo so sorry? So, can we think of women economic empowerment without analyzing the context in which we claim for this? Can we assume that women are homogeneously disempowered? That there are not class and ethnic relations that create new inequalities among them? When we analyze the second aspect, women's, women's political empowerment, we find similar patterns of inequality. A critical issue that drives the international development agenda is the number of parliamentary seats occupied by women. Latin America has advanced greatly in this field. Thanks to a set of affirmative action measures, the percentage of parliamentary seats that held by women went from 9% in 1990 to 25% in 2014. Women's presence in ministerial cabinets has also increased, although it is still far from being equal to that of men. In my country, as an example, we have 20 male ministers and just two female ministers. <laughs> in terms of presidencies, when, with the transfer of, of power from Michel Bachelet to Sebastián Piñeira in Chile last Sunday, there is not a single woman president left in, a, in the region. Clearly, women's political representation is in its infancy, despite our greater parliamentary presence. At the same time, when we take ethnicity and race, and race into account, these facts point to significant inequality among women legislators. According to Mala Hatun, of the, all the seats occupied by women in the region in 2014, only nine correspond to Afro-descendant women and 19 to indigenous women. In all, it is clear that having incorporated the notion of empowerment, the international agenda has kept alive the idea that gender inequality, sorry, gender equality cannot be reached without transforming unequal power relations. That is, an egalitarian project would not aim to integrate women into structures rife with inequality, but to transform those structures to achieve women's rights and make sustainable development possible. For this perspective, from this perspective, it is unlikely that such transformation could come through a top-down process. From this angle, the massive protest that women are leading in many countries, with Nuna Menos, with several other uh, massive mobilization, show that feminist demands have found new energy. 
In my country, Argentina, the feminist movement has renewed its rank. Today, it includes more young people than ever, and it has become massive, federal, and popular. At present, this seems to be one of the phases of empowerment. What they are claiming is for the control of their bodies, the legislation of abortion, and more effective policies against uh, violence against women. Within this context, what I think is that we need to rethink and renew our concepts and strategies for women empowerment. And we definitely need to mind all the gaps that we have among women in the third, country, in the third world. Thank you very much. very much. I think if you, if you could just uh, hold on to your questions and we'll have a Q&A at the end uh, for all, all our three panelists. So thank you very much. Thanks. I'm actually going to speak from the podium. Excellent. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm really uh, pleased and honored to be here. Um, when I travel around the world and, and I tell people I live in New Hampshire, they say, where is that? And I say, it's near Canada. And they say, oh, <laughs> <laughs> clarifies it. So it's, um, it's really nice to uh, travel a few hours north to be here. So the concept of women's empowerment is the dominant frame for efforts to expand women's rights and end violence against women. And from this perspective, it's essential for women to gain agency, voice, and choice and for our realities to be visible to ourselves and to others. Women's empowerment is a policy strategy focused on increasing the agenda of individual women to make choices and exert control over our own lives. Now, while this is the dominant frame, it's been subject to quite a fair amount of criticism over the years. Um, it emphasizes, this concept emphasizes agency, but it doesn't really account for the structural constraints on women's actions. And as Karl Marx famously stated, men, sick, make choices, but not under conditions of their own choosing. So I can't necessarily empower myself by an act of my own will. Outside forces constrain my ability to be empowered. Um, another critique is that the, uh, it's focusing on women, a binary gender category, and not uh, paying full, full heedance, uh, credence to the gender continuum. Um, there was an article in the New York Times uh, about a year ago from Rafia Zakaria who criticized uh, concepts, uh, kind of northern, global north concepts, conceptions of women's empowerment um, in kind of paternalist terms. And she was critiquing the idea that you can buy someone a chicken and empower them. Um, or give someone a packet of seeds and you can empower them. Uh, she had a very powerful critique. And she said the assumption behind this conception is the same across whatever you're giving women, that women's empowerment is an economic issue, one that can be separated from politics, um, along the lines of what my colleague was just talking about. It follows that it can be resolved by a benevolent Western donor who provides sewing machines or chickens and thus delivers the women of India or Kenya or Mozambique um, from their lives of disempowered want. Now, uh, these are actually, um, Coca-Cola has a women's empowerment uh, project called 5 by 20. Um, and the, another critique is that women's empowerment is very compatible with a neoliberal um, economic agenda. Um, in 5 by 20, Coca-Cola hopes to enable the economic empowerment of 5 mil million women entrepreneurs across the company's value chain by 2020. Now, that's a good goal, um, but there's some criticism there. And these, all, these are all really important points of critique of the concept of women's empowerment. Um, and I want to acknowledge them, and I'm sure that we will talk about them again um, over the next day, in, day or two. Um, but I want to bring up um, a slightly different perspective. The argument I'm going to present today, and, I'd like, and I'm going to be thinking through with you, is this. Empowering women requires understanding and addressing the behavior of men. So I'm going to be talking about men. Now, um, my mentor in college and graduate school is a political scientist named Carol Pateman, and every time she would walk into a room, every time she would go to a conference, she would ask the question, where are the women? If there was you know, some panel where no one talked about women, she would raise her hand and say, where are the women? And so today I'm actually reversing that and saying, well, where are the men? 
Um, and I think in understanding why misogyny and male violence persist, this is a, this is a worthy question. How, do we, how is this sustained over time? And can women be empowered without addressing the role of men in disempowering them? Now, I am not proposing to empower men or to shift the focus away from women, but rather to explore some ways in which shifting the focus to men's behavior might propel the global movement for gender equality forward. And I'm gonna talk through three examples that I've been kind of thinking about over the last year or so. Um, one is the Harvey Weinstein case. Now, um, this has been big in the US. I assume it's been uh, known here too, but Harvey Weinstein is a Hollywood producer um, who for decades, um, was engaged in um, violent sexual assault of um, women in Hollywood at various levels. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about what finally allowed Harvey Weinstein to be brought down. The second thing I'm gonna talk about is an incident that happened at Harvard uh, over a year ago um, in which uh, uh, the men's soccer team, uh, it's, they got its season canceled in a response to uh, some sexual hazing that the members of the team did toward women, to the members of the women's soccer team. So I'm gonna talk through that instance. And then I'm gonna, the third thing I'll talk about is an initiative started by the Australian government to bring men into efforts to promote gender equality that's called Male Champions for Change. So first, Harvey Weinstein. Revelations about sexual assaults committed by Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein unleashed a social movement known by the hashtags MeToo and Time's Up. Women's empowerment is definitely having a, a moment of a, of a sort with hopes that we're now in an after moment. So after this same thing, things will be different um, and we will not be going back to how things were before. Um, this is very much seen as a moment about women's empowerment, about women finding their voice and about speaking up against this violent sexual assault. But if we look at the specific details of this case, it becomes clear that this is not a straightforward story about women finding their voice or having the courage to speak out. From my read of this case, what brought Harvey Weinstein down was an article published by the New York Times on October 5th, 2017. It was written by two New York Times journalists, Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey. They gave several, um, after the article came out, they gave several interviews in which they spoke about how it was that they were able to do the reporting that led to the publication of this article. And they consistently, in those interviews, emphasized the role that the New York Times as an institution had in giving them the resources and the time and the backing and the, the uh, legal counsel in order to make this article go forward. Had the article appeared in almost any other outlet, it might not have had the same impact. Had the New York Times not decided to devote huge amounts of resources to supporting that investigation, that article could not have been written. By the way, there are other journalists, especially Ronan Farrell at The New Yorker, who also deserve a lot of credit for publishing stories on Harvey Weinstein. So in order to get so this has been going on for decades, this sexual assault behavior by Harvey Weinstein. In order to get women victims to go on the record, Cantor and Tui had to establish their trust, which was possible in part having the power of the New York Times behind them. And here's a quote from Megan Tui. Um, that was something that Jody and I had to do continuously throughout the reporting process, was just to assure people and say, listen, I don't know what your experiences has been with other news organizations, but I guarantee you, you have our word that this is a story that has the support all the way up to the top of the New York Times. And we're going to work at this story as hard as we can around the clock until we get it and get at the truth and we're going to publish the truth. Um, the reporters stuck with the story even in the face of intense pressure to drop the reporting. Again, Tui. By the end, Weinstein was trying to exert overwhelming force on the Times. He threatened to sue us. He had a large team coming at us. We were getting phone calls constantly. And that was only the stuff that was overt. There was a lot of behind the scenes attempts at suppressing the story. So Harvey Weinstein's behavior was an open secret for decades. But things didn't change until the New York Times published that story on October 5th. The sea change that occurred as a result was not simply a matter of women being empowered to tell their stories. They'd been telling stories in private for a long time. But it reflected the impact of a powerful institution exerting its leadership on a controversial issue and empowering its reporters by providing them with the resources and time to develop it. Um, not many newspapers um, have this kind of clout um, and, and financial viability, 
but in the wake of the 2016 elections, um, the, the amount of subscriptions to the New York Times have risen, and I think that's one of the reasons why the New York Times has this support and has decided to prioritize sexual harassment as an issue. So my second example, um, university sports teams being punished for sexual hazing. So the question I'm thinking about here is under what conditions will ordinary good men those who do not commit sexual assault and do not approve of it in any way, come forward to speak out against it. Some people are heroes when it comes to challenging powerful social norms and, and social mores, but most of us are not. In November 2016, Harvard University told members of the men's varsity soccer team that their season was being canceled because uh, because some members of the team had been, uh, had been giving sexually explicit grades to the women recruits on, to the recruits on the women's soccer team based on their appearance. Now, this uh, decision by Harvard was a response to a scouting report that the male soccer players um, were circulating among themselves. The student newspaper got a hold of the scouting report, published it, and then Harvard responded um, by canceling the men's soccer team season. The men's soccer team issued a public, does that mean I'm done? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, was this an effective punishment for the men's soccer team? Well, in an op-ed published in the Washington Post, my colleague in the government department at Dartmouth College and my husband, John Kerry, argue that Harvard's decision to cancel the men's soccer season could empower men who don't want to condone abusive behavior. John asked us in that article to imagine a player on a team being confronted in the locker room with older players or the team captains using sexist language and engaging in sexist behavior. He sees that this behavior is fundamentally wrong, but does he say so? If the ringleaders question his manhood, does he point out that they have no honor? If his coach doesn't back him up, does he walk off the team? Chances are that player will keep his mouth shut. But with Harvard's decision, thanks to President Drew Gilpin Faust, it increases the odds that in an ordinary situation, men will be empowered to speak out because if they don't speak out, they're gonna get their season canceled. So that really gets them where it counts. It's in their self-interest to challenge bad behavior. Now this is an op-ed that I could not have written. It had to be written by a man, by someone like my husband, who's been in locker rooms like that, who knows what that's like, and who has a sensitive understanding for what it, like, what it feels like to have be around that behavior, not want to condone it, but feeling the constraints of having to do so. So I think we need more men like John Kerry. I know I do. Um, last, I want to talk about uh, uh, um, male, ch male champions of change. So I arrived in Montreal this morning from New York where I too was attending the UN Commission on the Status of Women, which is a two week long series of meetings. Um, I spoke on a panel, it was one of 467 panels involving 5,000 representatives from NGOs around the world. It was fabulous. And one of the sessions I attended featured this initiative by the Australian government. Uh, the project is the brainchild of Elizabeth Broderick, the former sex discrimination commissioner in Australia, and during a panel at the UN on Tuesday, she said, women were doing their part, but in order to accelerate change, men need to step up and be equal partners of change, which is the slogan of this initiative. So she got some of the most powerful male CEOs in the country to commit to participating, the CEO of IBM, four major banks, the biggest telecom com company in Australia, and, wait for it, the head of the Football Federation of Australia. <laughs> so she got to them com to commit to actions that include, one, taking a pledge that said, um, they made these men say, I will never speak at event and an event where no women are speaking. They had to agree to show up to 75% of the meetings and they could not send a representative in their stead. They had to commit to the perspective of shifting the system, not fixing the women. And they had to make gender equality a core value for their, of their organization. Since then, 160 male leaders across Australia have signed on to this. The argument for why this has been effective is that once that, especially the Football Federation CEO, signed on, men were so competitive with each other that they all wanted to be part of it. 
And so now they're kind of crawling over each other to be a part of it and to be the most progressive in terms of gender equality. Um, so this is a story about the role of men in preventing gender equality and cha challenging misogyny alongside women as partners for change. Um, to conclude, how do these three examples, all of which hinge on the behavior of men, relate to women's empowerment? What do they suggest in terms of the viability and the concept and of, the, of the concept and the practice of women's empowerment? Most women's empowerment policies focus on women directly, but I think it's possible that women's empowerment policy could focus on men as well in particular ways. Um, in these three examples, uh, we see um, male-led institutions, um, in the case of the New York Times, um, a female-led institution, but a, um, a woman who has not necessarily spoken out on all instances, uh, the president of Harvard University, um, and the Australian government, creating a space in which it makes it possible for men to come forward. Men who support the cause, um, but might not have come, through, come forward otherwise. And when those in power take this kind of responsibility, it makes the burden on individual women coming forward and sharing their stories and kind of demanding empowerment, it makes that burden much lighter. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been trying to understand and unpack gender poverty and women's empowerment for a long time. Uh, in fact, long before the word empowerment uh, became a buzzword and also got co-opted in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. Um, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, as scholars of, international, of gender and development, I think we've, within about 10 years, watched women go from one end of the spectrum, so being cast as problems to be solved and victims to be rescued, to the other, as saviors who can solve the world's most pressing problems with just a little help from all of us. Um, and I can safely say that I've tried very hard to reject both the victimization as well as the valorization narrative in my research. Um, and, and we're flooded, I think, with that kind of imagery today where women can do everything. For anyone who's um, you know, following up on uh, Lisa's comment about buying, um, buying a chicken, I think you said, or buying a cow, you know, if you watch the girl effect ads, which I'm sure you have, where you know, something like a, a very simple intervention, like finishing school or buying a cow, once that's accomplished, we are told, girls will do the rest, change the course of history, and safeguard the future of humanity. Right? It's terrifying. I would hate to have that kind of pressure put on me. <laughs> I'm sure girls do too. So early in my career, most of my research focused on organizing and mobilizing strategies of informal sector women, on women and property rights, uh, which was particularly in the urban context. And interestingly, uh, my book on women and property rights was actually reviewed in the Canadian Journal of Law. A Okay, thank you, <laughs> by, by Rinda Narayan, our moderator today. Um, I also did some work on the role of NGOs as development intervent, uh, intermediaries. So a lot of this research was conducted in collaboration with the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. And I've drawn upon the work of several people at this conference in developing my research. So I'll start, in a way I feel as if I need, I, you know, I owe people a big thank you to quite a few people for making these terrific contributions to this field. So I certainly couldn't have gotten very far in my own research without the benefit of work done by people like Naila Kabir and Agnes uh, Kisambing, who I see, just to name just two people. In recent, work, in recent years, I've done a fair bit of work on social innovation and gender equality. It's interesting to have Myra Bovinik, I'm not sure if Myra's here yet, um, at this conference because she's one of the founders of the International Center uh, for Research on Women. And actually ICRW produced one of the only reports on the role of social and technological innovation in promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. And that research was quite foundational for the research I'm conducting at the present time in New Delhi, India, with a hybrid public-private NGO initiative called Women on Wheels uh, that trains and employs 
resource-poor urban women as chauffeurs and taxi drivers. Has anyone heard of that initiative? Okay, a few people. Um, I've written a fair bit about it at this point. It's kind of interesting because through this study of an urban economic empowerment project that brings together state agencies, NGOs, corporations, and social enterprises, I'm trying to document the emergence of a hybrid model of capitalism, multiple stakeholder governance, and civil society participation that I think actually can provide some viable means of promoting gender equality and social justice. One of the things I'm finding from doing this research is that some similar social and economic outcomes can be accomplished using both neoliberal and non-neoliberal, for want of a, wor a, a different word, uh, strategies. So the two don't actually have to be as different and as diametrically opposed as they're made, to be, made out to be in the development literature, and they certainly don't have to be mutually exclusive. So I draw upon, for example, Nyla Kabir's work on, on uh, empowerment, where she says, think about both the structures and think about the agency of individual women. So in looking at a program like this, like Women on Wheels, which where the training is very, very rigorous um, for women to learn to drive, but it's not just that training that makes the difference. There's also sort of this extended training on gender equality, on rights, on um, sort of agency, on conflict resolution, on self-defense. And I think that's what makes the big difference. And I'm for want of a better word, I think the women coming out of that program are empowered, not just because they've taken control over their own lives um, in terms of you know, being able to participate in the labor force really well, to be able to earn well, to have control over their own lives, but because it also makes a big difference in eroding very deeply entrenched class as well as, um, I would say, gender hierarchies in that context. So I found that particular program quite inspiring. Um, my other current research program is aimed broadly at understanding how to optimize gender equity and social justice in the global green economy. So as part of this research, I've tried to understand how we can promote decent work and gender equity in sectors like clean energy, transportation, construction, and manufacturing that will experience dramatic growth and change as we transition out of fossil fuels. So this research is necessarily global. I look at industrialized countries, I look at emerging economies, and developing countries, because there's a lot of potential to learn from one another in this, in, in this particular context of a global transition out of fossil fuels. And this transition, the global transition out of fossil fuels, is not happening in an intuitive way. So many emerging economies and developing countries have actually made much more progress in generating green employment and in taking issues of gender equity and social justice, frankly, far more seriously than many OECD countries, including Canada, has. Um, so I find the potential for learning across, you know, um, basically, regardless of whether the research is based in an emerging economy or a developing country or an industrialized country, there's a lot of potential for learning um, across different contexts. So in this messy, complicated terrain, how do we unpack women's empowerment? How do we develop tools and strategies to understand the process of empowerment? Um, I don't really know the answer to the question. I think I have some guidelines that have served me well, and I look forward to feedback and discussion. In my own work, I found the global development indicators. So I found the ones developed by the UNDP, so the Human Development Index, the Gender Development Index, the Gender Empowerment Measure, which, is to, which we no longer have. We now have a Gender Inequality Index and the Multidimensional Poverty Index. I use them quite extensively. Is it five? <laughs> I think that's my five minute warning. Yeah, that's okay. So I find them very useful, and I use them quite extensively in my research because I find that, um, especially in dealing with resource-poor contexts, there are real advantages in concentrating on indicators you know, like those, like life expectancy, sex uh, ratios at birth, maternal mortality, 
and educational attainment, rather than just focusing on subjective utility in the form of you know, pleasure, satisfaction, or desire of fulfillment, since these can be very strongly influenced by social conditioning and often by a resigned acceptance of misfortune. And they're definitely also very gendered in, in how people perceive um, you know, satisfaction and well-being in what Amartya Sen calls there's a there's a sort of a often a lack of recognition by women themselves of the spectacular lack of equity in the in the in the in the ruling arrangements. So I find that it's very helpful to focus on some of these established indicators of of human development and well-being. Having said that, of course. Uh, a lot of these baseline indicators convey the impression that, that women's disempowerment, as it were, is largely a function of poverty. And this can be quite misleading because we've observed in many contexts that while economic prosperity may reduce gender inequalities and basic well-being outcomes within a society, it can often impose other restrictions, for example, on women's free movement and autonomy. I'm reminded of a time when I was working, uh, doing research with the Self-Employed Women's Association, and I tried to get a sense for um, sort of some indicators of, of, um, of empowerment, and I was motivated by a study that was done with the Grameen Bank, uh, you know, sometime in the late 90s, where they identified mobility and visibility as an indicator of empowerment. When I put that question, to uh, urban self-employed women in, in Ahmedabad, where I was doing my research. Many of them were women like vegetable vendors, for example. They actually didn't agree with me at all, because they had always been very mobile and visible. And they didn't see their mobility and their visibility as a function of empowerment. They saw it as necessity. And they didn't find it empowering. In fact, they would have preferred to be a little less mobile. So that led me to sort of understand how um, misleading some of the indicators can be and how problematic it is for us to load on sort of our assumptions, our methodological preferences and our political affinities onto what we mean by empowerment. Um, so I generally think that um, I'll conclude with just a little bit about my research on women's employment in clean and renewable energy. This is something that I've developed um, quite extensively at this point in trying to understand opportunities, patterns, um, opportunities, constraints, as well as patterns for women's employment in renewable energy. And I'm finding that there is tremendous potential to create employment in this transition to low carbon economies as we transition out of fossil fuels. But it's also very clear that women can gain optimal traction from these new forms of employment only if there are wider socially progressive policies in place, including state intervention to create uh, robust social welfare infra infrastructure, high quality public education, um, and high quality access to health as just a few examples. Um, if we don't have those things in place, there's, kind of, there's almost no point in talking about can employment in a certain sector empower, empower women. The way I put it simply, being able to read at night because a certain community now has solar lanterns actually means nothing to someone who doesn't know how to read. So I think we really need to focus on all of those issues. Uh, I'm personally a big supporter of universal social protections. Um, I think we, we are at a point where we can definitely afford to de-link social protection from employment status so that actually everyone has sort of some certain basic types of social protection and income available to them. I think in that context, um, we can have a much more engaged conversation about sort of employment options and possibilities and choice and agency. So I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much to all the fabulous panelists. Obviously, my career as a chair and moderator is now over. <laughs> sincere apologies to everyone. And I'm so glad that uh, the speakers were brilliant, not so much the chair. So we have 15 minutes for questions. And uh, if you could, perhaps if you have the time, just tell us your name and your, who the question is addressed to. And uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Krishna. 
so my question is for the panel generally, but kind of takes off from Professor Baldur's uh, introduction and the anecdote that Professor Badwa just told us about. So, uh, like, could, could you tell us a bit more about, especially like talking from your individual experiences about what your advice to graduate students who are just starting out in their research careers located in the global north be on how to uh, navigate the tensions if there are between the more uh, normative understandings, at least the way I see it, uh, understandings of empowerment and the more ground level understanding, like for the lack of a better word, of en uh, empowerment where often, but not always, you find that the word empowerment even cannot be directly translated into you know, other languages. So how, 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 as a graduate student, can we think about navigating these tensions as we start our research careers? Thank you. Monica, I'm a student at the law faculty. I study track one peace processes in women's participation. And I would like to make a reflection on what Professor Valdez, she gave some brilliant metaphors that I think we can all place into the greater context of the inability to penetrate that threshold of why women aren't participating formally, which, which when um, we look at informal and formal participation, and we tried to treat this issue, my takeaway from what you said is about men's participation and um, institutions. And without institutionalizing the women, peace, and security policy, right now it functions as a policy of the Security Council, and it's not institutionalized. And I'm also reminded by what you said of George Mitchell, um, Senator Mitchell's work in the um, Good Friday Agreement, and I think that it's fundamental to look at institutions and men's participation um, in the context of formal empowerment, and I just would like to thank you for those wonderful stories. Uh, thank you. Maybe we'll give our panelists a chance to answer the question before we take the next one. Um, could, could, you, could I ask you to clarify the, um, the, uh, the tension um, yeah, between one, normative conceptions of empowerment on the one hand, but then I wasn't clear exactly what on the other hand. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, so for, for example, you know, wh when I go to do my fieldwork and I speak to, for example, women, uh, other women about their understandings of empowerment and, it, and for everyone, I mean, though you can argue that it's a very subjective understanding that people can have. So you know, what uh, on the policy side might count as an indicator of empowerment might not necessarily be the subjective understanding of that individual. So how, how do you go about navigating that, especially when you're just starting out thinking about these issues? Thank you. I think um, just a few, a few guidelines. I mean, I honestly, these days, I try to do my work without using the word empowerment because it's come to me in so many different things to different people. It's become such a buzzword. I have no idea in what context it'll appear next, right? So it's, you know, Gucci is trying to empower women. Nike is. I mean, it's everyone is, right? It's so um, I, I talk more about choice, agency, and constraint. That's how I think about it. And to be completely honest, I also want more complicated narratives about issues of gender equality. I was a little disappointed that the Sustainable Development Goals had no mention of boys and men. So in the sense of, you know, even in their, their genuine and well-founded concerns about boys and men relating to, for example, education, right? That there are genuine concerns about underachievement of boys and men in many parts of the world that I think needs to be part of the narrative. If you're going to talk about gender equality, then it needs to be less of a conversation that's less zero some game, as it were. Um, in terms of indicators of empowerment, again, they make me very nervous because indicators by their very definition are simple windows into complex realities, right? We all know that. So my strategy has always become of late to, to, do, to combine, to do the mixed methods thing, first of all, right? To use um, surveys, to use quantitative methodologies, and then to also create space for women's own perceptions of how they feel about themselves in that conversation. So I think that would be my best advice to you, is to be very, very aware of context 
that you're doing the work in and of what exactly empowerment in that context means and allowing women to speak for themselves about how that looks and feels. I don't know, would you like to respond to that? Or? No, I think okay. it's okay. So uh, I'm taking the second one as a comment, of course, and I'll um, see if there are any other questions for our panelists, please. Don't be shy. Yes, we have two questions. Hello? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, my question would be for Professor... Can I read Rob Vipasha? <laughs> yeah. Um, Actually, in the, in the panel, we had a lunch where we were talking about choice uh -huh. and how do we measure choice, and it is, um, it is so difficult. We were talking about, just during lunch, how, for example, we found on our field that teen pregnancy uh, sometimes is choice, is made out of choice, and it's a life project, and that uh, with just con information about contraceptives is not going to be reduced. So when it comes to... We, we could assume that if that came, that decision was made out of choice, that they could be empowered, but it is not good for the health if they start being mothers, for example, at the age of 12 or 13, and they are, if we are talking about low-income women, they are reproducing the, the poverty to their children. So m my question is when we speak about choice and without imposing our positionality, how do we really make the difference of what is a, cho a choice that would make them empower or not. That I don't talk about empowerment anymore. I just, I prefer to talk about agency, choice, context. There was one more, constraint. Because all choices are made within constraints, right? So I think it, it's really important to understand the constraints within which people are making choices. And all choices are essentially made within constraints. So I should have mentioned the fourth uh, word that I often take into account. Uh, so I think context is also the most important piece in that conversation and, const and constraint. You. You know, I feel like several times a year I change my opinion about what the role of men should be. You know, and you know, I still use the word empowerment because I remember when you put the word women and empowerment in the same sentence, people thought you were a lunatic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm still using it, but I really hear your point. You know, I love these examples you gave about, you know, the role of men. So let me just share a little bit. You know, my whole area of emphasis has really been on economics and the economic empowerment of women. And I've been working with a group called SheEO which is really all about women for women. And I have seen such extraordinary results. Now, you know, they're just taking it into more developing economies. You know, these results are really in the developed world. That's really why I came today to see what was new, to see if I could find where some of these bridges might be. So, you know, while I really love these examples, and, you know, maybe I have to change my mind again, but honestly, what I've looked at this economic piece, I mean, women's co-ops, women's groups, women's business associations, supplier diversity for women, all those kinds of areas have really had an extraordinary impact on putting at least more money in women's pockets, regardless of how you define empowerment. So I guess just comments on that or any enlightenment you can provide. So um, I have too have devoted my career to working on women's issues. And um, even though I say gender, it usually ends up being about women. Um, and uh, so this is a relatively new way of thinking for me as well. I don't mean to suggest that it should supplant any of that work. Um, I think this is an addition to, or as, as I've been taught to say, both and. I think if I might just say one more thing, I think there's a real, uh, there is some conflict today. 
between sort of talking about the empowerment of individual women, as it were, right? So there, and, and you're absolutely right about that, that there are, uh, you know, whether it's co-ops, whether it's different kinds of social innovation where we see women doing better economically. So individual women are being empowered, as it were, but there is still, you know, but if we go back to the, to the, to the original sort of notions of empowerment, that was about the feminist notions of, you know, removing structural barriers for women as a gendered category or a constituency, right? So there's a real tension there, but it doesn't quite always have to be, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive, I find. I think that there are many initiatives where the depth of the impact upon individual lives is really great, so there are differences in individual lives, but collectively there is also you know, a huge difference. So I don't think we need to think of them as being mutually exclusive. Um, I think they can be, in fact, they can coexist and they can be mutually inclusive, and I think they can make a difference in eroding structures as well. So the work I've been doing with uh, Women on Wheels, for example, they've actually trained so far maybe a few hundred women, right? So it's a small number of women, but the depth on individual lives is really quite dramatic. So it's very dramatic changes in individual lives, but you also see sort of a, sort of a collective empowerment so it's, it was done on individual lines. So I would say that the training program, everything, to me, it's kind of a bit of the definition of neoliberal, right? So very much focusing on individual empowerment. But when it, when it comes together, when the women get together as a group, you also see collective empowerment. And you also see kind of not quite the dismantling of social structures, but you st you're starting to see kind of the erosion of very entrenched class sort of barriers, for example, very entrenched gender barriers and class barriers. So I think that's where we see the really interesting stuff happening. And there are quite a few examples of those. Um, so that's a really good example. I worry a little about the way some other things are talked about, where a very simple intervention, you know, there are some incredible things loaded onto it. So I've been asked questions like, you know, can renewable energy empower women? Well, no. Right, like that's my honest answer. A lot of other things have to be in place for women to be able to benefit optimally, or men for that matter, from a similar, simple intervention like expanding um, you know, the, the availability of solar lanterns. So I think, at least that's where my thinking is at the moment, that it's possible to do both with a lot of depth. Mm -hmm. Can I add yes, please, go ahead. I would like to add, add something about the choice of adolescent pregnancies that links to what Vipasha was saying. When we think about subjectivities as part of the oil of empowerment, let's say, like, like the energy that drives empowerment, we can also think on not only th that the constraints in which adolescent women make choices about their pregnancies can also be like uh, I don't how do you say this, dismantle by some pol policies very, very uh, strategic and empowering that as uh, comprehensive sexuality education. I mean, when we do, when we focus on children and adolescent girls and boys, and we do it, it as a public policy aimed at uh, changing the paradigms in educational systems, we can really, uh, get some difference, make some difference about women's empowerment, gender equality, and the environment in which adolescent boys and girls make choices for their own. So maybe we also need to think about empowering girls and adolescents through educational systems that are really making the difference where they are set down. But of course we are struggling against some uh, conservative uh, models and especially in some countries where Catholic Church and, and different uh, religions are making constraints for this. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question over here, please. It's okay. <laughs> 
Um, I have a question. So you talked about family planning and you also talked about boys being involved, but I'm wondering over the last couple of years, it seems like earlier, at least five or 10 years ago, family planning used to be really big and then um, involving boys used to be pretty big. There seems to be like major themes are occurring as the years passes by. And I'm wondering from your perspective, from a research and policy perspective, what are the areas that you think actually deserve a lot of attention but haven't been giving that particular attention in terms of women empowerment and gender? I mean, one, uh, one area that always pops to mind with regard to that question is, the, is um, uh, I mean, the broad category of intersectionality, but so um, n none of us that I heard use the word indigenous, for example. Um, so, you know, thinking about, um, a lot of people have talked about individual women's responses to policy, but you know, are we are we really thinking about all possible women? Any other? Would anybody else have to respond? Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll thank our brilliant panelists. Thank you very much for those insightful comments and remarks. Thank you to the audience for the uh, for the engaged questions. Uh, thank you very much. A big hand to our panel.